Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 5, a chapter that divides nicely into two parts. It's a long chapter, but uh, we covered the first half last week, and you remember Jesus was on the east side of the Sea of Galilee and the Gerizines or the Gedarenes, depending on which gospel you are reading, but the region of the Gentiles where he uh, cast out a demon, really a legion of demons from a tormented man. And the result was the people of the region, rather than being grateful, asked him to leave because they had lost their pigs in the process of the deliverance of the demoniac. So he left the east side and now he returns to the western shore of the sea. And we begin the chat with verse 21 of chapter 5. When Jesus crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up. And on seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him. And a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. A woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official, saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was, what, had, what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official, and he was... He saw a commotion uh, and people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died but is asleep. They began laughing at him. But putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that something should be given her to eat. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it. Let's pray. Chapter 5 of Mark's Gospel is the account of three miracles which have been described as covering the whole condition of humanity. Uh, first regards a, a maniac and demoniac no one could tame. Then next is a woman no physician could heal. 
And third is a daughter her father could not revive. In each case, the afflicted were helpless and hopeless and in despair. They were what we would describe as being at the end of their rope. I don't know the origin of that expression, at the end of his rope or her rope, uh, but in, it pictures in my mind a person climbing down a tall building on a rope, but coming to the end 10 floors above the ground. That's a bad place to be. But the fact is, often it is only when a person comes to the end of himself that he comes to the Lord. And what that shows is there is always hope for the hopeless. In fact, when people are self-satisfied and comfortable, they are often in the worst state of all. When the maniac was liberated from legion and the pigs drowned, the people of the Gerasenes begged Jesus to leave. They were materialists. Their, their prosperity had not helped them spiritually at all. They, they valued swine more than the Savior. That's one of the lessons we saw last week. So he left at their request. He crossed over the sea to the Jewish side and back to Capernaum where a large crowd was eagerly waiting for him and quickly gathered around him. What a change it was. No sooner did he leave those who pleaded for him to please go than a man pleads for him to please come. His name was Jairus, and he was an important man. He was one of the synagogue officials, Mark tells us, one of the elders responsible for maintaining order in the synagogue and, and the function of the meeting in the synagogue. He knew all about Jesus, he would, being a man of the synagogue, about his teaching, about his authority, and about his power to heal. He'd probably seen some healing. He'd heard the Lord's teaching. He also certainly, being a man in that position, knew about the controversy around him and of the attitude of the Pharisees toward him, how they hated Jesus. So, he knew that approaching Jesus for help would not have been approved by the religious leaders, probably by many of his friends. But Jairus was a man at the end of his rope. He came to Jesus, fell at his feet, and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. One writer said, this man's words leap like lava from a vol volcano. That's true, that's a good way of putting it. His heart was in turmoil, his words were full of anguish. She was his only daughter, Luke says. We learn later that she was 12 years old, but Jairus calls her my little daughter, expressing his deep affection for her. And so finding himself in a crisis, this distinguished man of the synagogue forgot himself and in front of the crowd fell at Jesus' feet begging him to come to his house and heal his child. The Lord didn't hesitate. He was occupied with the large crowd they were demanding his attention. There were, no doubt, there were no doubt people in the crowd who had needs, physical needs, needs of teaching. He was giving his attention to them, but he, he never refuses a plea for help. He always made time for those in need. And Mark wrote, he went off with him. He went off with the synagogue official and the crowd went off with him. And Mark tells us it was pressing in on him. At this point, a second story begins, a story within a story, because in the crowd was a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years. 
So for the 12 years that Jairus had the, the joy of his only daughter in his family, this poor woman had suffered the misery of this scourge in her body. That's what Mark calls it in verse 29. The, the Greek word for affliction means whip or lash or scourge. It expresses the sting, the, the torment of it. And for 12 long years. But also, Mark writes, she had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all. In fact, she had grown worse. She was at the end of a rope. She had used up all of her options. None had helped. Humanly speaking, she was incurable. Her health was worse as a result of her efforts, and she's now destitute. She'd spent all of her money on a futile attempt to get well. Now, what made this especially sad was her, her condition also made her ceremonially unclean. Now, that was very significant in that society, that culture of Israel. The law prohibited any contact with her. Whoever touched her in her condition would be unclean. Now, the rabbis devoted an entire book in the Mishnah to this subject. It, and it gives some remedies, most of which are quackery, and none help this woman. It, it, it's hard to, uh, to imagine the physical and psychological struggles she had. Chronic illness is a desperate condition. Every day is hard. A, a person loses hope. Her condition left her weak and alone. And that was maybe one of the worst parts of it. She was alone. She was unclean. Cut off from all friends and family, if she had a family. She lived a life of embarrassment. She lived a life of, of shame for 12 years. She was desperate and in despair. But long after losing all hope, there was hope. Jesus had come and was passing by. She'd obviously heard of the wonders that he had performed and believed that he could heal her. But she was unclean. She was afraid to approach him boldly, to approach him directly, to, or, or to even touch him. Maybe she would be shunned by the crowd. Maybe she would be rejected even by him in her condition. She didn't want to take a chance. So she approached him secretly. She came up behind him and touched his cloak, thinking, she could do that without being noticed and still be healed. Now, that's faith. It's not perfect faith. It was maybe mixed with some superstition, thinking that there was power in his garment. And she believed a touch was necessary. And so did Jairus, for that matter. He believed that the Lord needed to come into his house and put his hands upon his daughter. So neither of these two individuals in our account, the woman or Jairus, had the faith of the centurion that Luke speaks of in Luke chapter 7, a Gentile who said, though the Lord wasn't worthy to come in his house, but his Servant was sick and dying, and he knew that just by, a, by the Lord speaking a word that the servant would be healed. Well, they don't have that measure of faith, though they're the ones that should have had that kind of faith. Still, she had faith, and she acted on it. She reached out, and she touched his cloak. It was his outer garment or coat in fact, Matthew, who also recounts this incident, tells us that it was the fringe of his cloak, one of the tassels that hung from the corner of his cloak. The law required that an Israelite wear tassels on the 
corners of his garment, uh, each with a blue cord, and it's a reminder of the commandments. In fact, some of the, the Jewish people that live in the neighborhood here, if you look at the way they're dressed, look at their shirt, their coat, you'll find a, a tassel hanging from a, uh, probably four tassels hanging from their, uh, their clothing. Well, this is what she touched and was healed instantly. Mark writes, immediately the flow of blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. At the same moment, Mark writes, immediately Jesus perceived that power had gone out of him. Then an amazing thing happened. Jesus stopped turned around and asked, who touched my garments? Now remember, Jesus was not taking a leisurely stroll with friends. He was going to Jairus' home. The situation was urgent. A child was in the last moments of life when the Lord stopped in the middle of it all and asked, who touched the fringe of his coat? The, the disciples were baffled by that. You, you see the crowd pressing in on you, they said, and you say, who touched me? Could have been anyone. And what was curious about that? Why do you care to ask that question? But the Lord didn't mean who touched me in passing, but touched me for healing and touched me with faith. So he ignored the disciples' response and Verse 32 says, looked around to see the woman who had done this. He spotted her before she came forward, showing that he knew who she was. But for her benefit, for her benefit, he sought her out by means of his question. When he looked at her, she came trembling and fell at his feet, fearful, and told him the whole truth. But the Lord immediately relieved her fears. He, he spoke to her with concern and compassion. He, he called her daughter and reassured her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. That statement, your faith has made you well, was made for a couple of reasons. First, it was to disabuse her of any superstitious notions that her healing happened because of the garment or tassel. It was the result of, of his personal response to her faith. It had nothing to do with the things that people often elevate. And people are captured by things like that, the shroud that people think he may have worn. Or you can go into Catholic churches as I have in Europe and seen up at the altar these magnificent cathedrals and there are relics, pieces of bone, locks of hair from the saints, objects containing blood, things that are kind of grisly to me, but they're venerated. Now, none of that is correct. Jesus is disabusing her of that altogether. This was the result of her faith. And second, <clears throat> by making a public declaration of this uh, for all to hear that uh, she was healed and healthy, he opened the way for her to be reinstated in society to be accepted by the people. She's no longer unclean and not only reinstated in society, but to worship. She could be a part of all of that now. What a blessing that would be. His interest in her was, was more than for her physical well-being. He was giving her life back to her. He was making sure she was received by others into their fellowship and to worship. And thirdly, this shows that we are to be public about the Lord's blessings. Lamps, as the Lord taught just in the previous chapter, are, are, are brought out not to be put under a bed or a basket, but to be put on a lampstand or to shine. 
We are to be public about our salvation and our Savior. So he, he brought the woman out of the shadows, so to speak, brought her out of hiding. It was right to do that. It was right for her to declare what had happened, what the Lord had done for her, and it was good for her. It was good for her. That's why I consider this a, an amazing thing that he would stop in the midst of everything when things were so urgent to care for this woman. Jairus was an important man uh, in addition to being a man with pressing needs. So in the sense you can almost understand why someone would want to help this man. He's an important man. But the Lord was equally concerned about this unnamed obscure woman who was not important in the eyes of anyone. She may have been a, a poor weak woman who was lost in the crowd, noticed by no one, but she was not lost to him. She was important to him, as all are who come to him. That's why I say that even though a, a person might come to the end of his or her rope, despair is never unavoidable. It is not the necessary end. There's always hope in Christ. He receives everyone who comes to him. Receives everyone. Regardless of the, the person's condition or circumstances, he has the heart of his heavenly Father, the heart of mercy, the heart of compassion. All this time, <clears throat> Jairus was waiting anxiously, wondering about his daughter. You can imagine what's going through his mind, thinking, let's, let's move. When just as the woman was receiving this good news, he received sad news. I came from his house and told him, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? There's no point. It's over. All hope is gone. Death robs people of hope. But Mark says that Jesus overheard what was said and quickly encouraged the father. Do not be afraid any longer, he said. Only believe. Proverbs 12, 25 says, Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. That is a kind word of truth, not just an encouraging word. That's what we often give people. We don't know what we're talking about sometimes. It's going to be okay. Everything will be fine. It's not what the proverb is saying. It, it's a word of hope that's real, a word of hope that comes from the wise. And the wise person can give that. Which is to say, the Christian can give it. He can give hope. She can give hope. And the ultimate word of wisdom and encouragement is only believe. Believe in what? Believe in God's Word. Believe in Christ. Trust Him. Always trust Him. Nothing. Nothing can deliver from anxiety, from despair, like that. In fact, only that relieves anxiety. And in the providence of God, I think that's what we see here. Let's not miss that. In the providence of God, Jairus had just been given an object lesson on faith in Christ and His power. The woman had, had believed with weak faith and had been blessed. The miracle was for his benefit too, at just the right time. So Jairus dismissed the advice of his friends. He trusts in the counsel of the Lord, he believes in him, and they continue on to his house. Jesus took no one with him except Peter, James, and John. When they arrived, the house was full of mourners. People were weeping and wailing. In the ancient East, burial occurred soon after death. The, the climate 
in that region made that necessary. So this was the crowd's only opportunity to mourn. It was also the custom to have professional mourners and they knew how to put on a show. Matthew said flute players were among them. That's what Jesus walked into. Flutes playing mournful dirges, women weeping and wailing loudly. Mark calls it a commotion. When he entered, Jesus put an end to it. He knew their grief was staged. It wasn't sincere and they weren't necessary. So he told them to leave. The child has not died, but is asleep. Well, that made the mourners laugh derisively at the Lord, which showed that their grief was only a show, but also showed how genuinely they disdained Jesus. They're sort of a female version of the Pharisees, I guess. The girl was dead. They knew it. Death was their business. They'd, they'd seen hundreds like her. For all of his reputation as a wonder worker, he couldn't recognize death. They were certain he couldn't reverse it. Death has the last word. It is final. Maybe Jesus could heal the sick, but death is something else. It is irreversible. He had come too late and they laughed at him. They dishonored him. Now, I think there's more of a point here than simply they dishonored him. They mocked him. In doing that, they are confirming a fact, and that is that this girl was really dead. Now, the Lord knew that. The Lord hadn't misdiagnosed the girl's condition. He said she was asleep because her condition wasn't permanent. In John chapter 11 and verse 11, Jesus said of Lazarus, that he had fallen asleep. And he said that because knowing that he was dead, he knew that Lazarus, like a sleeping man, would rise again. His situation, his condition was only temporary. He would make him rise up. And he was saying the same thing here. The mourners were right the, about the girl, but they were wrong about him. He would raise up this young girl and conquer death. Death would not have the last word. So the Lord put them all out, put them out of the house, took with him the child's father and mother and his own companions, meaning Peter, James, and John, and entered the room where the child was. And now it's quiet. And I think that tells us something about our Lord. He enters into places of confusion and He brings order. Where there is confusion, the Lord is lacking. That is, it's the situation is lacking the Lord. And He is the one that it must bring order to the situation. And he does that here. He's a God of order. And in the quiet of that moment, he took the girl's hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which is Aramaic for little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk for she was 12 years old. She could walk around because she wasn't a little baby, Mark is telling us. She was old enough to walk and so she does that immediately. She gets up, she walks, and immediately her parents were completely astonished. The Lord then instructed the parents to give her something to eat, which is a small detail, but a, a personal one, which shows the natural care of Jesus as, as the great physician. It, it also shows the Lord's complete concern for us. He not only considers the great needs like giving life, but the lesser, ordinary needs, the, the, the daily kinds of needs that we have of nourishment, of food. And by, by walking and eating, it proved that she was not only alive, but she was alive and well. The Lord didn't just raise her up to life, He, he raised her to health. She was 
once again, or maybe, maybe for the first time in her life, a healthy child walking around, vigorous and happy. And the parents were completely astonished. As they should have been, or maybe as they shouldn't have been. After all, this is the Son of God, and this is a demonstration of that. Is anything too wonderful for him, as God told Abraham? Is anything too wonderful for me? Is anything too difficult? On the one hand, this is routine for him. This is no difficulty for him to raise the dead. And yet, it is a wonderful thing. It is an astonishing thing. And I think that, that is the, the response of faith and the response of worship. We experience a good thing from the hand of the Lord. And, and we should be astonished by the wonder of it all and, the, and the, what, is a, what is a great gift from him. It should produce this kind of response as it did in them. But the Lord gave them strict orders to tell no one what had happened. He knew he couldn't keep the miracle completely secret from the public, but he wanted to avoid unnecessary publicity. Now Mark doesn't tell us why that is. He just gives the account of what the Lord told them. And so we, we can only guess as to why he would say, don't let this out, don't let anyone know about it, even though he knew that it would be known. But perhaps it was to protect the child, protect her from being made a celebrity. She needed time to rest. Maybe it was to be also a help to the parents. They needed time alone with their child to be with her and to reflect on what had happened before they would no doubt be interrogated by the Pharisees. He was going to have to face that crowd. Still, word got out, Matthew records, that the, the news spread throughout all the land. Jesus raised the dead. Well, that's, that's news that's going, to, that's going to spread quickly. What it shows is that the one who can still the storm and sea who can command a legion of demons to depart, who can heal disease that physicians could not heal, has authority over death itself. He has authority over all aspects and conditions of life that control humanity and threaten our well-being. From the elements, to the spirits, to disease and death, the last enemy, he has control of it all. That is the power and the authority of God. But by itself, the miracle doesn't prove that Jesus is that, doesn't prove that he is more than a prophet or an apostle. Elijah and Elisha, Peter and Paul all raised the dead. But the prophets and apostles never claimed to be God. Jesus did. Taken together, all of these miracles show that he has the authority to forgive sin. We did that earlier in the gospel, you remember, and that raised such a storm among the Pharisees. Who is he to forgive sins? Only God can do that. And yes, he's gone on in each chapter to prove that that is exactly who he is. He is God. He is God's eternal son, the second person of the Trinity. So there is... No difficulty in life too great for him. He is the eternal Son of God. He asks us to do one thing, only believe. And not necessarily believe perfectly, simply believe with the faith that we have, feeble as it may be. The woman and Jairus didn't have flawless faith. But they believed in Jesus in spite of the circumstances and against the odds, and they both experienced miracles. It's not the strength of faith that matters. It's the object of faith that is essential. Everyone has faith. Atheists have faith. Their faith is in science, or really their faith is in human reason. Years ago, I had a conversation with an astrophysicist, and I can assure you we didn't talk much physics. But he was a professor of a, at a leading university, uh, I think it was the University of Arizona, which has a significant physics department, and he was an atheist. He told me that he was convinced 
that in the next 20 years, science would discover the origin of the universe. And I think he was saying computers are giving us so much information at such a, a, an accelerated rate that in the next 20 years, we will know the origin of everything and it won't include God. Now, that was over 40 years ago. It was 42 years ago, I think, the summer of 1975. That's faith. That is faith in man. That is faith in human reason. That's faith in computers. That's faith in rationalism as opposed to revelation. I don't think they've improved upon the answer that we find in Genesis chapter 1. The Bible begins with the crucial answer of where everything came from. Computers haven't, haven't contradicted that yet. But the point is, that's faith. That's the faith of an atheist. The issue isn't simply faith. All have faith. Everyone has faith. The issue is the object of one's faith. And if Christ is the object then faith is good even if it is small and weak because the object is strong. After all, Jesus said, if your faith is as small as a mustard seed, you will see mountains move. Now, that wasn't to praise small faith. That's not to uh, say weak and frail faith is okay but simply to say that faith alone will do. And that faith, though small, will grow and become great faith when it is in Christ and it is in His revelation, when it is in the Scriptures. We are simply to look to Christ. He is sufficient. He is where our hope is. The woman tried all the, the doctors she knew. She, she went to the specialists. They couldn't heal her. She finally despaired of human resources. Jairus lost hope in doctors and may have, have struggled with the decision to seek Christ. I'm, I'm sure he did, knowing his background, knowing his friends, knowing what this would put him in, the situation if he goes to Christ. I'm sure he struggled with that. His Pharisee friends would have 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 not approved of what he had done. Maybe they counseled against it, but finally the hopelessness of the situation drove him to Christ, just as the despair of the woman drove her to Jesus. They came. He received them, and they were blessed. Certainly the application here for us is, in the Lord's counsel, only believe. Trust in Christ. Follow Him. All of that means believe His Word. Believe the promises that He gives us in Scripture. That is where He speaks to us. That is where we learn of Him. That, that is our standard and guide. It is our only standard for faith and practice, the Word of God. It is true. And faith in God's Word, Christ's Word, will never disappoint. He blesses even weak faith. And then He makes it grow strong. But of course, to trust in Him, a person must believe that Jesus is God. He is the eternal Son of God, and He is man. He is fully God and fully man, having a true body and a reasonable soul. Only the God-man could be our Savior and our support, who both sympathizes with our condition and acts upon it. He sympathizes and He gives help. Certainly does both. He knows our condition. He's experienced it. And so is our great high priest. As the author of Hebrews tells us, he has sympathy. But certainly the great lesson here is that He gives life to the dead, the, the spiritually dead, life that is eternal. The woman who was sick and unclean, the girl who was dead and unable, are a picture of mankind. We are sinners. We are dead in our sin. We are therefore unclean. 
unworthy of God's care, unworthy of his company, and unable to change. We can no more change our heart than a leopard can change its spots. But God comes and God heals. Christ saves by his power, by his death. He saves all who look to him. And his willingness to do that is displayed here in Mark chapter 5. It's too bad that so often people must come to the end of themselves before they come to Christ, but that's, that's the nature of the human heart. It does not want to yield to God. But in God's providence, people are brought to the end. They are brought to that point in life, to the end of their rope. So they will look to Christ and fall into his saving arms. You read stories like that. In a, a, a tragic fire that occurred in London a few months ago, it was the uh, Grenfell Tower, I believe, a woman was crying for help and she dropped her baby from the 10th floor and a man on the street caught it and saved it. Now that happened a few years ago. I don't know if it was on the West Coast or the East Coast. I remember seeing an interview with a man who had caught a woman who was in the same kind of situation. There was a fire and she, he told her to jump and she did and he was able to catch her and put his shoulder out of joint, but she lived and he was happy to talk about it. He was a hero. Well, that's a, a, a very faint picture of what Christ does. I, I can imagine a person would have doubts about dropping from such heights, but in the case of Christ, he is strong where faith is weak, and he always saves those who trust in him. Because his death, his sacrifice is all sufficient. William Cooper wrote, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Jesus, the one who stopped the fountain of blood in a poor woman, became himself a fountain of blood for us that we might be washed and have full forgiveness. That's the grace of God. And we plunge beneath that propitiating flood through faith alone. Only believe, Jesus said. It is true. So if you're here without Christ, come to Him. Don't despair. Believe in Him. But if you are so content in your life of unbelief that you have no thought of Him, no thought of what your future will hold without him. Then I end with the words Donald Gray Barnhouse would end his sermon with, his sermons with. Oh, give them no rest or peace until they find rest in thee. And may that be true for you. If you come to Christ, you will find rest and peace and joy. May God help you to do that. Help all of us to have that fruit of the Spirit in our life. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us and this great passage of Scripture. What a great chapter this is where your Son demonstrates his power over everything in heaven and earth. The demons obey his command and he dismisses them. Disease, sickness, is under his control and command, and he dismisses it. And death as well, who raises the dead. That is our Savior. And someday he will raise us. We will all come to that point in our life where, we, it, where it ends. It's the way of all flesh, as David said and Joshua said, and it is something we know to be true. And should the Lord not come back in our lifetime, we will go to the grave, but that is only temporary. It is sleep, as Jesus said. We will be in your presence, but those bodies 
will only be temporarily in the grave and they will be raised to a glorious future. We give you praise and thanks for that. We look forward to it. Help us to live lives that honor him in the present, we pray. And we pray these things in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.